Democrats, by the president, his people, they do it. And the president just yesterday said, you know what? Go cut more. Go get more savings. That's the status quo. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield two minutes to the gentlelady from North Carolina, Ms. Fox. The gentlelady from North Carolina is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my colleague from Wisconsin for the exceptional leadership he has been bringing to this House on this issue of the budget. I want to say I agree with my colleague from Georgia. We are the greatest country in the world. We also have the smartest people in the world, and they're not going to buy this demagoguery anymore. The president and Democratic political strategists are engaged in demagoguery of the worst sort. Yesterday, the president accused us of wanting to leave six ki sick kids to fend for themselves. But we've heard this before. On the eve of the 1996 welfare reform, Senator Frank Lautenberg voiced his concern that the bill would transform America into a third world nation, leaving, quote, children hungry and homeless, begging for money, begging for food, and even at eight and nine years old, engaging in prostitution. Senator Carol Mosley Brown trumped Lautenberg by wondering aloud whether the welfare reform bill would prompt the widespread auctioning of abandoned children into slavery. Jill Nation of the Nation did them one better by predicting that working and middle class communities all over America will become scary, violent wastelands. Representative Jim McDermott made a more prosaic prediction that, quote, that within two years of enactment, the bill would put 1.5 million to 2.5 million children into poverty. Even Daniel Patrick Moynihan warned that the law would, quote, have children sleeping on grates. What happened? Child poverty rates fell by 1% per year in the five years following the passage of the 1996 Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Act, and they remain below 1995 levels, even though the nation is still emerging from a severe recession. Transforming welfare by, among other things, block granting the program and giving states more control over its implementation, cut case backdrop of falling poverty rates. In almost every particular, the critics were wrong. The aim of the social safety net should be to empower individuals, putting them in stronger position to achieve. Government can play a positive role in this area with policies aimed at helping those who are down on their luck get back on their feet. General, ladies, time has expired. I need for 30 more seconds. Oh, gentlemen, yields you 30 additional seconds. This budget strengthens the social safety net and promotes policies that help people recover from poverty and lead self-sufficient lives. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from Wisconsin reserves. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Maryland. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. We ask every American to read this budget, this Republican budget, and see whether or not it reflects their values and the choices that they would make. And we believe when they do that, they'll reach the same conclusion that the Bipartisan Fiscal Commission did, which is that it's simply unbalanced. It's simply unfair. It puts all the burden on the sacrifice on working men and women, and it does provide those folks at the very top, once again, we've seen it before, with a big tax break. And when it comes to Medicare, it's a fact. Seniors are no longer going to be able to choose to stay in Medicare. They're going to be forced into the private insurance market with ever-increasing costs and ever-declining support. That is rationing care. That's what insurance companies do. If you don't have enough money to buy the benefits that they are offering, you don't get them. If your doctor's not on that plan, tough luck. And so those are the choices that we're making this evening. And I hope as we go forward, the American people will look very closely at this proposal. And I'm, I'm confident they'll reach the same conclusion the Bipartisan Fiscal Commission did, which is... It's just not, not balanced, and it doesn't reflect American values and priorities. With that, the gentleman reserves. Yield. The gentleman from Wisconsin is recognized. I'm going to yield myself two minutes, uh, Madam Chair. Now, let's take a look at what our drivers of the debt are. <laughs> Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare. The health care entitlements are the biggest drivers. The black line here shows our revenues. These three programs alone alone take up all federal revenues. You throw interest on top, which you have to pay interest, 
by 2035, they consume every single penny of every federal tax everybody pays. Now, why are we proposing what we're proposing on Medicare? Because we have experience that this kind of thing works. <laughs> giving people more choices, giving people more, having more competition works. Prescription drugs. That's a program very successful, very popular. When that program was passed, it was projected to cost $634 billion over the budget window. It ended up costing $373 billion. It came in 41% below budget. Premiums are lower than were anticipated. Name me one other government program that actually came in 41% below cost projections. There isn't one. Why did this one do that? Choice. Competition. The senior is in charge. We are not interested, Madam Chair, of giving control over Medicare to 15 unelected people to decide where, when, how, and under what circumstance they get their Medicare. We protect Medicare for current seniors. We deny the 15 people on the board the ability to ration their care. And we want 40 million seniors to have the choices. We want them to be in control of their Medicare. Because what we've learned, giving myself 30 additional seconds to make my point, <laughs> what we have learned is that giving them more control, the senior, the beneficiary, the patient, not the government, competition works. We've tried so many different plans at rationing care, they don't work. One person does work to reduce prices. The consumer. That is why we are saving Medicare. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized. Yeah, go ahead. Is recognized. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I have to say to, to say this plan saves Medicare is, in my view, Orwellian. It does remind me of the phrase uh, from many years ago that you have to destroy the village in order to save it. I, I have to say that if you look at what we're doing here, you're saying to seniors, you got to go into the private insurance market. Now, the chairman mentioned a couple other examples of uh, the private market, but in this case, we've already experimented through Medicare Advantage with that kind of private plan within Medicare. And you know what we discovered? That you had to subsidize them at 114% of the fee-for-service program. It cost us more for Medicare Advantage. In fact, one of the reforms that we made as part of the Affordable Care Act was to say, we're not going to ask the taxpayers and folks who are on Medicare fee-for-service to subsidize those private plans that are running over cost. And you know what? In this budget, our Republican colleagues kept that reform. If it was so great to have the Medicare Advantage plan, how come they took the f part of the savings from that plan? They did not. So it is a big mistake to say to seniors, we're going to throw you into the private insurance market with an ever-declining voucher premium. The reason this isn't premium support, it doesn't support the premium. What federal employees and, have, and members of Congress have is a premium support system through a fair share formula. This is not a fair share for seniors, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Wisconsin. Madam, Madam Chair, I'll just simply say we, we do actually put $10 billion back into Medicare Advantage to, to make sure the program stays alive. Um, but I want to just simply uh, yield two minutes to a member of the Budget Committee, the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Hillscamp. The you, Mr. gentleman Chairman. from Kansas recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, as a freshman, I guess I am a little confused here on the floor of the House listening to this debate uh, about the budget and uh, I guess I'm a little confused of which uh, party was in charge of this chamber for the last four years as we ran up trillions and trillions and trillions of deficits. And the concern wasn't about deficits. The concern was about spending and how much more could we do and how much more could we throw into the economy. And we look at the results today unemployment levels that we haven't seen for a long time, Madam Chairman. And I guess as we debate and discuss this budget, of course, uh, we might be a little bit rusty. It's my understanding it's been a couple years 
since uh, we even allowed a budget debate on, on the floor. And I, I welcome that debate. And, uh, but one thing that was mentioned, that uh, read the path to prosperity. And I agree. I agree with my colleagues. Please read the bill. Please do. And here's what you will find. A path to prosperity, we believe, runs not through Washington, not through this floor, certainly not through the other chamber, but the path to prosperity in this country runs through the hard work of entrepreneurs, a flat or fair tax system, a closed tax loopholes, regulatory reform, work rather than welfare. The result is this, Madam Chair, we expect we expect a million new jobs potentially might be created if we get Washington out of the way, as we see in the path of prosperity. Madam Chairman, ideas have consequences. And we believe, this plan believes in one thing, in the power of the American people, not Washington elites. This plan, this budget, is about liberty and freedom. Madam Chairman, I hope and pray 2011 will be remembered not for what we do here, but for whether or not the end result of our actions will help us restore the American dream in this country. With that, I yield back my time. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I yield a minute and a half to the gentleman from California, former insurance commissioner for the state of California. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. For eight years, I was the insurance commissioner in California, and for eight years, I battled the health insurance industry. What we heard on the floor was that 2011 will be remembered. What it will be remembered for is the death of Medicare, the demise, the death of Medicare, the most successful insurance program, the most successful health insurance program in this nation. It works. It is efficient. It is effective. It is a nationwide standard policy available to every American 65 years of age and older and some of those who are younger. I heard the, the author of this bill a moment ago saying competition would make it better. In fact, it does not. In fact, it does not. The private health insurance industry is inefficient. It is ineffective, it is discriminatory, and it clearly, clearly harms customers. There is a profit motive that has to be paid for. There are compensations for the sale and compensations uh, for those who sell the insurance. All of that adds up. It is also extremely um, inefficient in that there are multiple policies, multiple people that have to be paid, insurance companies have to be paid, different deductions, different co-pays, all of that is out there. And when you add to it that my Republican colleagues have done everything they possibly can over the last two months to... Expired. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> My Republican colleagues have done everything they can to repeal the Affordable Health Care Act, with ha which had insurance reform in it. Without the insurance reform, which clearly they want to do away with, you are throwing senior citizens to the sharks, the health insurance sharks. I urge us not to do that. The gentleman's I yield back time, time has expired. The gentleman from Wisconsin. Madam Chair, I yield myself 30 seconds to simply say we have new data from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services on national health care expenditures. In 2009, the last year we have data available, Medicare costs grew by 7.9 percent. Private health insurance plans costs grew by 1.3 percent. Would the gentleman yield? Competition does work. I do not yield. And with that, Madam Chair, I yield two minutes. Yield and like to hear I do the... not. And with that, Ms. Madam Chair, I yield two minutes to the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Duffy. Thank you, Mr. The, Chairman. The gentleman from Wisconsin is recognized for two minutes. And thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, as a freshman in this House, uh, it has uh, been uh, unique to sit and see one of the age-old tactics that take place, scaring seniors. But not to move the ball down the field, but for political points. The gentleman was just referencing uh, Medicare and telling the American people that it's not broken, that it's going to continue to work. These are CBO charts. If you take a look at them, it's broken. We can't afford it. We have to reform this program to save it. And to deny that is trying to scare seniors for your own political game and for gain. And I think that Would is the shameless. gentleman yield? Uh, no, I won't. You know what? I think we have to be honest with the American people. 
come out and say, you know what, this is a program that if we reform it, we can save it for our current retirees. But not only that, those who are about to retire, 55 and older, we can save the program for them as well. And we can modify the program for those of us in later generations. But let's not try to scare our seniors tonight and tell them that this plan is going to take away their care, because it's not. This plan and its proposal is that those who are 55 and older are going to continue to get the same plan that exists today. The reforms are for future generations, and with those reforms, we're guaranteeing that current retirees get the benefits that we promised them. If you say you care about our seniors, you would join with us, and we would all work to resolve this issue and make sure our grandmas and our grandpas continue to get the benefits that our country has promised them. I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized. The gentleman from Maryland has two and one quarter minutes. How much? The gentleman from Wisconsin has seven and three quarters minutes. Uh, gentleman from I, I miss the gentleman from Maryland has two and one quarter. Oh, you want me to catch up? Yeah. <laughs> I yield two minutes to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Woodall. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized for two minutes. I thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and I'm glad I had the opportunity to speak after my freshman colleague uh, from Wisconsin. I was down on the floor early. I walked back to my office. They asked Mr. Maroney, who's answering the phones in my office, said, what are you hearing about? Are you hearing about the, the continuing resolution? He said, no. I said, are you hearing about the budget debate? He said, not really. I said, what are you hearing about? He said, I'm hearing from seniors who are scared. I'm hearing from folks on Medicare who are scared. Now, who does that surprise? It doesn't surprise me, and I don't know what the goal was when we went down this scare tactic path. And I will say to the ranking member, I know you know better. Right? You've got a persuasive case to make, a persuasive case to make for why your vision is better than our vision. But you're scaring people. You're scaring people. I will yield to have the gentleman tell me if anyone age 55 years of age or older is going to be affected. Isn't it true? That the Republican budget if the ranking member is not going to answer Mr. my Ju question, I will isn't, not yield. Isn't it you should be ashamed. Isn't it true? Be ashamed. Mr. I reclaim my time, well, Mr. Van Hollen. That's because you don't like the answer I, you're going to hear. It's because Order. you won't give me that answer. Don't want Order, to hear Madam the Chair. Order. The I gentleman from my Georgia time. controls the time. Just say we have honest debates here. We have honest disagreements here. But folks are scared because you're scaring them. And you know good and well you don't need to. I want to associate myself with Mr. Duffy's comments. That we could get together and solve this problem, or we can just choose to scare people. We can just choose to scare yield. people. I will yield to the gentleman to tell me if anyone age 55 years of age or over will have their benefits would changed all in any way. members order. please suspend? I, uh, yes, they will have their, their prescription Van drug Hall. benefit changed. Point of order, ma'am. They will have the their prescription drug benefit changed. Madam Chair, the House is not in order. I thank my chairman for yielding. Yeah. Yeah. From Madam George. Chair, point of order. Point of order. Madam Chair, a point of order. All members are reminded to address their comments to the chair. Thank you. Does the gentleman from Wisconsin seek recognition? I, I will. Just, I, I think I still have more extra time, so I'll, I'll yield one and a half minutes to the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Mulvaney. The, the gentleman from South Carolina. Half minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I wanted to speak very briefly to a topic that was raised earlier tonight uh, by my colleague, Mr. Ellis from Minnesota. Um, and it's a comment that uh, a message that has been repeated several times tonight and was in fact repeated several times during the committee uh, process, which dealt with the subsidies um, that we give to big oil, to oil and gas. I will tell my folks, uh, especially my, my colleague from, from Maryland, Mr. Van Holland, that I share the frustrations that you have with those types of subsidies. I also share the frustrations that I have with other members of, of my conference that alternative energies receive seven times as many subsidies in the tax code 
as oil and gas. In fact, if you take the subsidy, the, the excise tax credit for ethanol, that number rises to 10 times. So I do share your frustrations with the uh, amount of tax credits uh, that, uh, that the code currently gives to oil and gas, but I'm 10 times as frustrated, Madam Chairwoman, with the, with the subsidies that we give to alternative energies. I would invite, Madam Chairwoman, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle who, who, who have that same frustration to join us and vote for the budget. It's the best chance they're going to get this year to get rid of these subsidies as part of this process of closing the loopholes, lowering the tax rates, and broadening the base. Thank you. Now, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized. I reserve. I'm going to close it up. Do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Madam, Madam Chair, the gentleman from may, Maryland. May I how much time do I have remaining? This Two and one quarter minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. The we've had a from Maryland's recognized. We, thank you. We've had a spirited uh, debate this evening <clears throat> about fundamental choices that we need to make as a country. We all agree that we have to reduce our deficits in a predictable, steady way. The question is, how do you do it? And we believe, as did the co-chairs of the Bipartisan Fiscal Commission, that the Republican plan is unbalanced. And it's unbalanced because it asks very little on the folks at the very top and reduces dramatically our investments in our kids' education. And it does end the Medicare guarantee Seniors will no longer be able to stay in the Medicare program. They will be forced into the insurance program. And it immediately, it immediately does end the prescription drug benefit, something we worked hard to close, the donut hole. It ends the effort that was put in place under the Affordable Care Act to end the donut hole. So I would say to the gentleman from Georgia who spoke earlier, those seniors who are calling his office, they will lose that benefit in closing the donut hole right away if this Republican budget passes. And for other seniors and people who have been paying in the, the Medicare system through their payroll taxes, we want to make sure they have the benefit of the Medicare guarantee. And throwing them into the private insurance market and giving them a deal that members of Congress do not give ourselves is wrong. It is absolutely wrong. We have a fair share deal, and we're asking seniors to take a raw deal. We have a, we have a true premium support system for members of Congress, where the federal government shares the risk of increasing costs. Under the Republican plan, they're asking seniors to do what they don't want members of Congress to do, take all the risk of the rising costs. Those are not choices that reflect American values and priorities. We should not be giving tax breaks to the folks at the top and ending the Medicare guarantee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Wisconsin is uh, recognized. Madam Chair, I yield myself uh, the remainder of the time. Uh, first, let me say, with respect to the, the Medicare guarantee, we keep hearing that. As you know, because we said it over and over again in our budget. By the way, go to uh, budget.house.gov if you want to read the plan, and I please encourage people to do that. With the new Medicare plan for the people 54 and below, it's a Medicare guarantee. The plans you'll be given to select from, just like it, a system that works like the one we have, like the prescription drug benefit plan, they're guaranteed plans. You're guaranteed to get them if you want them. And your subsidy is guaranteed. Now, we simply say wealthy people shouldn't get as much of a subsidy as everybody else. Lower income people should get a bigger subsidy and as people get sicker, they too should get a bigger subsidy to protect their premiums. And I would simply say the greatest danger, enemy, threat to Medicare, it's the status quo. Medicare goes insolvent to nine years. But let me look at this from a different perspective. We've had a lot of debt before in our country. You know, when you, have, when you buy a house or a car or get a business loan, you get debt. And what matters is how big is your debt relative to your ability to pay it. It also matters is who are you borrowing it from? You're borrowing it from your local community bank, 
You're borrowing it from your brother-in-law? Fine. Where are we borrowing our money from? We used to lend it to ourselves. Americans would buy T-bills and lend it to ourselves. In 1970, 5% of our debt was held by foreigners, 95 by Americans. 1990, 19% of our debt was held by foreigners. Today, 47% of our debt is held by other countries. Number one is China. We're borrowing 42 cents of every dollar today, and half of that from other countries, number one being China. Look at where we're headed. We are headed with a crushing burden of debt. The debt goes to double the size of the economy, then triple the size of the economy, to eight times the size of the economy. The CBO tells us the economy crashes in 2037. Their computers can't figure out how the American economy can grow past the year 2037 because of the debt burdens. We can't keep borrowing money from other countries to cash flow our government. We are giving them our sovereignty. We are losing control of our own destiny. We are giving our children a debt prison. Why is this happening? Because politicians from both political parties have been making promises and promises that are empty. We need to get government to live within its means. We can't keep spending money we don't have. And by the way, you don't fix this by raising taxes and raising taxes and raising taxes. You fix this by cutting spending. Novel idea, I know it is in Washington, so we're going to start. We're going to start by cutting $6.2 trillion in spending. We're going to start by putting in the right policies to grow the economy. We're going to start by keeping the promise to people who have retired so that their Medicare and Social Security goes there for them. We're going to start by saving these programs for future generations so they're not empty promises. We're going to start by preserving our social safety net and making it more adaptive, resilient, and sustainable for the 21st century. We want to repair the social safety net so it works. And we want to gear it not toward keeping people on welfare, but getting them back on their feet into lives of self-sufficiency so they too can flourish and reach the American dream. We're going to start by passing this budget so that we can give our children a debt-free nation, so that we can maintain the legacy of America, which every generation prior to ours upheld, which is give the next generation a more prosperous America, a better chance, a better chance at securing the American dream. If we don't do this, if we don't fix this, if we don't make the tough choices now to get this under control, we will be the first generation to sever that legacy. Madam Chair, that's a disgrace. It's within our control. We see this coming. We know what's happening. We know why it's happening. And if we don't fix this before it gets out of control, shame on us. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Brady, and the gentleman from New York, Mr. Hinchy, each will control 30 minutes on the subject of economic goals and policies. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas. from Texas is recognized. Madam Speaker, on behalf of the Joint Economic Committee, I uh, yield myself as much time as I may consume and will uh, give my remarks in the well. The gentleman is recognized.
Thank you, Madam Chairman. You know, this country is uh, starved for truth tellers. People in Congress will just tell them what the problems this country face, uh, give them options, uh, and uh, help them make the right choice. People who are strong enough to lead and bold enough to lead at a time where a country needs leadership. When it comes to the budget, when it comes to the economy where the President has failed, House Republicans will lead. The Paul Ryan budget helps spur job creation in America today. Stop spending money the government doesn't have. It lifts the crushing burden of debt. And this plan puts the budget on the path to balance in paying down the debt over the long term, and it puts the economy on the path to prosperity. Let's talk about the economy. It is the number one concern of most people, and the debt and deficit have a lot to do with it. Uh, we ha are uh, undergoing one of the worst recoveries we've seen in a long time. It is uh, two to three times slower than uh, the Reagan recovery, and there is reason for that. We were told that by the President and Congressional Democrats, if we just spent money, spend in the stimulus, spend in increased deficits, that the economy recover, would recover. And they were wrong. After spending hundreds of billions of dollars on the stimulus, we have two million fewer jobs in America today than when the stimulus began. We have fewer jobs today than when all that spending took off. We were told, if Congress passed all the stimulus, that our unemployment rate today would be 6.8 percent. It's 8.8 percent. And only that low because so many people have given up simply looking for work anymore. They've lost hope. And then finally, for those who say we just spend more to create this economy, they were off their predictions by 7 million American jobs. It's time to stop listening to the economists who got it wrong and start listening to economists who got it right. Let's take a look at what spending has done to our economy in America. Here is a chart. It looks back on the last 40 years in America, and it tracks federal government spending against job creation along Main Street. Not government jobs, but jobs in the private sector are small, medium, large side businesses that our economy depends upon. The blue line is government spending. The red line are jobs along Main Street. As you can tell, look at the blue line, look at how different job creation is. In fact, over each of these four decades, not only is there no correlation between federal spending and jobs along Main Street, it's a negative correlation. In each of the four years, as government spending goes up, jobs along Main Street go down. But look at this next but, uh, chart. We also went back the last four decades in America and asked about private business investment. What happens when companies large and small buy new equipment, buy new software, buy new buildings, invest back in the economy? What happens? Here's the chart. Blue is the private fixed investment from business. The red is job creation along Main Street. And as you can tell, uh, it's a very close correlation. In fact, there is no substitute in America for private investment in the economy. No substitute, no rebates, no stimulus, not shovel-ready projects. Nothing is a substitute for creating jobs like getting businesses to invest back in their workforce, in their workplace, and in the economy. Recently, recently we had... I had the Joint Economic Committee take a look at the last 40 years economic studies of our competitors around the world. Competitors, countries who got themselves in debt trouble and how they worked their way out of it. And, uh, and you would be uh, uh, interested in the results of this study. Uh, what it shows is that uh, three, three key points to it. One is that the countries that were most successful in getting their debt down, getting hold of their financial uh, path, they didn't do it by raising taxes. That didn't succeed. They did it by reducing spending. That's how they best and most successfully got hold of their debt. Uh, at 21 times in the 10 different uh, of our global competitors, countries got a handle of their on their debt successfully by reducing spending. The second takeaway from this study called Spend Less, 
OLAS, Grow the Economy, was that countries that got hold of their debt the right way also grew the economy as well. Economists agree that countries that get their financial house in order grow their economy over the long term. What this study shows is that with our competitors, if you get a handle of your spending the right way, you grow it in the short term as well. Um, here is uh, Canada. Neighboring Canada got themselves in financial trouble. Uh, they were, their economy was growing at a paltry less than 1% a year. They lowered their debt as a nation about 12 percentage points. Their economy took off and for uh, almost uh, uh, 14 years, 16 years, they averaged economic growth of almost 3.5%. Sweden, another developed country with a developed economy like ours, they actually had an economy that was shrinking, it was actually contracting. They got a hold of their financial house and put that in order as well, reducing their debt by more than 11 percentage points, and their economy took off, growing 3.5% a year on average uh, for uh, almost a decade. Uh, New Zealand did the same, yes, and you may ask, well, look, uh, we're not Canada, we're not New Zealand, we're not Sweden. But 26 times in nine of our competitors around the world, countries that lowered their debt by reducing spending grew their economy strongly, not just long term, but in the short term. They didn't grow it a little. Those countries uh, rocketed to the top quarter of economic growth in the world. Um, countries that reduce their spending do it the right way, grow their economy. And here's another third, in, again, telling point about this is that not all spending cuts are the same when it takes when it comes time to grow the economy um, not all spending cuts are the same what these economists showed is that the nations that grew their economy the most successfully undertook cuts that were large credible and difficult to reverse so they took they made cuts in savings that mattered and the cuts in savings that grew the economy make sense they shrunk their federal workforce they right-sized it to what they could afford they eliminated duplicate programs, obsolete programs, uh, as a business would, uh, programs a waste of money. Uh, they, uh, they reduced subsidies to corporations and in interfering in the free marketplace. Finally, they tackled their entitlement reforms in health care and in pension. What was interesting was that, that even if the reforms they made in their entitlements didn't affect the current beneficiaries and phased in those reforms over time, it sent the right signal to the marketplace. And what happened in each of these countries is that businesses no longer facing higher taxes because of all that spending felt comfortable getting to reinvest back into their workforce, back into their country, uh, in the economy. Households like ours, um, no longer facing higher taxes to pay for all these spending sprees, uh, felt more comfortable buying larger ticket items like cars and houses. And as we know, when businesses invest, jobs along Main Street grow. It's clear time and time and time again, like businesses, countries that can handle a hold of their debt, do it the right way and put themselves on a financially sound path, grow. And America's economy can grow as well. The budget resolution presented tonight by Chairman Paul Ryan meets the tests that spending reductions must be large, credible and difficult to reverse once made to boost our economy. The Ryan budget tackles the medical entitlements that are driving federal spending higher. It attacks corporate welfare by phasing out government guarantees to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. It eliminates subsidies for green energy and reduces agriculture subsidies by $30 billion over the next decade. The Ryan budget rolls back non-security discretionary spending to its 2008 levels and then freezes it for five years. It adopts a number of the recommendations from the President's own fiscal commission to eliminate waste and achieve real savings in our budget. It eliminates agencies and programs identified by our own government as wasteful and duplicative, and that alone saves over $100 billion in the next decade and reduces the federal workforce, right-sizes the federal workforce by 10 percent over the next five years by attrition, simply by hiring only one new federal employee for every three employees who leave or retired, and together that saves almost $400 billion. The Ryan budget envisions a pro-growth tax reform 
that lowers the top income tax rate for both individuals and companies to 25 percent and makes us competitive again in this world. The Ryan budget is a fiscally responsible plan that accelerates economic growth and job creation. It is a game changer for this nation and tells the truth about our challenges and addresses it with ideas and proven solutions that move us forward. With that, uh, Madam Speaker, I'd reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from New York is recognized. Thank you very much. I think it's uh, very clear for us to understand and remember how the economy here grew and uh, became much more positive and, pro and progressive during the Clinton administration, during those, uh, those eight years. The, uh, the deficit that uh, Clinton inherited when he went into office was dramatically reduced and brought back a surplus when uh, he left office. And uh, when he left office, the uh, national debt was in the neighborhood of about a little over $5 trillion. By the time the next president, George W. Bush, left, the deficit was about $10.7 trillion. So it's important for us not to have the same kind of experience now that uh, we are trying to get pushed to us by the opposition here on the other side of the aisle. The most critical challenge that we face as a country, of course, is the need to create new jobs. If Congress hopes to get the economy moving at the right pace, we're going to have to take this challenge for job creation very seriously. The question is, what should we do and what should we not do to reform government so that we can better compete in the world economy and yield strong, sustainable, long-term growth and prosperity? After a hundred days, Republicans have failed to put forward a single plan to create jobs. Instead, They've laid out a budget plan that shows us exactly what not to do. We must remember how we got into this budget mess in the first place. While my friends on the other side would like to pretend that our economic woes began the very second that President Obama took his hand off the Bible and was sworn into office, we know that that's not the truth at all. In fact, it was quite the opposite. The things that he did as president were positive for the economy, and we're seeing that today. We're seeing the economy growing, we're seeing unemployment declining, we're seeing employment going up, all of that as a positive effect of the actions of this president. My friends on the other side pushing this budget are the same people who carried President George W. Bush's agenda through Congress and in doing so, nearly doubled our national debt, as I said, from about $5.7 trillion to $10.7 trillion over the eight years of the Bush presidency. We need to make sure that they're not able to do that again. They did so then by recklessly lowering taxes on the wealthy with the promise that doing so would create jobs and strengthen our economy. Well we know that neither of those happened. In fact, just the opposite occurred. They did so by passing a prescription drug plan that is a major giveaway to the pharmaceutical industry without finding a way to pay for it. And they did so by taking us into Iraq under false pretenses and committing us to what will ultimately be several trillions of dollars. Now we are seeing economic inequality at record levels. The wealthiest 10% of the population here in the United States of America receives nearly half of all income in our country. And the richest 1% has seen its share of the national income increase by nearly 10%. And they are now at about 35% of all income. All of that increasing for the richest and declining for working people across this country. This trend has consequences, and it is no coincidence that the last time we saw inequality at this level was during the Great Depression in the 1930s. 
But instead of working to correct this problem, the House Republican proposal acts as a huge wealth transfer program from the working class Americans to the rich. Overall, two-thirds of the cuts the Republicans propose take dead aim at working class Americans to lower their economy and lower their economic conditions. The Republicans' budget plan eliminates Medicare, forcing seniors to buy insurance in the private marketplace using a coupon that barely covers a fraction of the cost of care. It cuts food stamps, Pell Grants, and low-income housing. And at the same time, our friends across the aisle here, their plan would give away $2.9 trillion in tax cuts to the hugest, biggest corporations and to the wealthiest Americans. This is the exact wrong approach, and it will severely damage our economy, hurt the middle class, and impoverish senior citizens. Let's take a closer look at how this plan hurts seniors. Their budget eliminates Medicare. It eliminates Medicare and creates a new voucher program that would saddle seniors with a large portion of their health care costs. They would then be more responsible for it, and the whole health care system would decline. The Republican budget also makes prescription drugs more expensive for seniors. The health care law we passed last year is gradually eliminating the gaps in prescription drug coverage. The Republican plan undoes this essential reform, forcing seniors to pay out of pocket. The Republican budget also threatens to make nursing home care unaffordable by cutting $771 billion from Medicaid over a 10-year period. Medicaid currently covers nearly half of all long-term care costs, and we know what would happen if their plan was to be successful. All of that would be essentially eliminated. The Republican budget also cuts $10 billion from Social Security's administrative budget, which will impact service to seniors. What this plan does to America's seniors is absolutely unacceptable. But the worst part of it is that while they cut Medicare and Medicaid, and they cut prescription drug coverage and the Social Security Administration, they also cut taxes on the very wealthy, reducing substantially the amount of taxes that the wealthiest people in this country pay, while at the same time raising taxes on everyone else. Now, 10 years ago, the Conservative Heritage Foundation projected that in 2011, 1.6 million more Americans would be working as a result of the Bush tax cuts. They were wrong. They were wrong then, and they are wrong now. We know what happened then, just the opposite of what they predicted. The Republican debate isn't about good policy or the facts. It's about a dogmatic approach to governing and doing what's best for the very rich. Doing what's best for the very rich, regardless of how it affects everyone else, who are the main promoters of the economy. Working class people, middle income people, are the people who drive the economic growth here in America. If they're forced to decline their economic conditions, then the whole economy of this country declines. All of that is, is needed to be understood, and the actions that they are proposing must be avoided. Even President Reagan's budget director, budget director rather, David, David Stockman, recently said that he finds it, and I quote what he said, he finds it unconscionable that the Republican leadership, faced with a $1.5 trillion deficit, could possibly believe that good public policy is to maintain tax cuts for the top 2% of the population. We know that that isn't the case. We know that is going to be just the opposite. 
We know that tax cuts for the wealthiest, making the wealthiest people in this country even wealthier, and driving down the economy of the working people, is going to have a deadly effect on the economic circumstances across this country. Tax rates are now lower than they were, even under President Reagan. And yet the Republicans are actually proposing to cut taxes, again for the very rich, lower the corporate rate, and keep special tax earmarks for big oil, tax earmarks for big oil, which is now growing to be one of the highest growing economic aspects of this country that we have to deal with. Tax earmarks for big oil and for the biggest companies and the biggest companies particularly that export American jobs overseas, continuing to give tax cuts to those economic companies that take jobs out of the United States and exports them to other countries. What a big mistake that is in the context of rescinding this economy. Overall, the Republican budget plan for 2012 will not balance the budget and while it does not balance the budget, it eliminates Medicare by replacing it with a private voucher program that will make it impossible for seniors to get health care. It also provides huge new tax breaks for the wealthy while cutting key investments in our economy. All of these proposals that we are facing here are clearly deadly. If they were to be successful, the economic circumstances that is now just getting better in this economy as a result of the actions by the Obama administration would be reversed and it would be reversed dramatically and we would see a downslide in the economic circumstances here in our country. We need to oppose this effectively and we need to have a policy that is going to focus its attention on working class people on the need to create more jobs and to create more jobs more effectively. I reserves. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. The gentlelady just yielded myself uh, 30 seconds. I would remind the listeners that it was Democrats who fought the prescription drug program for our seniors, who last year slashed a half a trillion dollars from our seniors' programs, which will hurt our local hospitals our nursing homes, our hospice programs. Uh, they're going to drive 7 million American seniors out of their Medicare Advantage plan. And yet they failed to lead to preserve Medicare for every generation once and for all. They failed. We're going to lead. At this time, I'd like to, uh, to, to yield three minutes to a new member of the Joint Economic Committee and one of the leaders, uh, not at this time. At this time, I would like to yield three minutes to one of our new leaders on the Joint Economic Committee, the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Mulvaney. The gentleman from South Carolina is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, when I travel my district, I, I've, I've tried to figure out a way to explain to people and to myself how to make sense out of these trillions of dollars. Um, and I do it this way. I put it in numbers that I can understand. I tell folks to assume that you're a family who brings home $46,000 a year and you sit down at the beginning of the year to do your budget, and when you add up all of the things that you spend money on, you're spending $78,000. And then I ask them, see, when you're doing that, and you're making $46,000, you're spending $78,000, I want you to realize that the visa bill in the drawer is $281,000. And that's where we are as a nation. And I tell them, as we try and figure out a way to save money, I remind them that the first thing that we did in this Congress was we cut $35 million from our own budgets. To lead by example, we cut our own budgets in this House by $35 million. And in that world where you're spending $46,000 and you're spending $78,000, excuse me, you're making $46,000, you're spending $78,000, you're trying to find $32,000 of savings in your household, that $35 million represents $0.70. Cents. That's how big the numbers are. Um, and I think folks back home have started to grasp it. I certainly have started to grasp it. But I do get some good questions when I, when I give that presentation on the road. Uh, uh, some folks will ask me, they say, well, you know, if I was in that position at my household, not only would I try and cut expenditures, but I'd also try out and go get another job. I'd try to make a little bit more money. And I said, you know, that's a really good point. And that's what most families would do. With government, it's different. With government, the only chance they have to get that additional job, to get more money to come in, is to raise taxes. And when I tell them, when they ask me, so why don't we just raise taxes, I say, because it simply doesn't work. 
It simply does not work. It has never worked. This graph shows the top marginal tax rates going back to the 1950s. For those of you who are around or have studied the area, the top marginal rates in the 50s were actually above 90 percent. The top marginal income tax rate in the 1950s was above 90 percent. And the government was still only able to take from the economy about 20 percent of the economy. 18.5 percent is the average over the course of the last 50 years. So even when tax rates were as high as 90 percent, the government took only about 18, 19 percent of the economy out in taxes. That number has stayed bizarrely stable over the course of the last 50 years. We've lowered marginal tax rates, we've raised marginal tax rates, yet the government only takes out 18, 19, at the most 20 percent. Raising taxes does not bring in more money to the government over the long haul. It may for a short period of time, it may for a year or two, but that's, the world doesn't work on a static model. The word, world works on a dynamic model. And when you raise taxes, the economy grows slower, and eventually we get back to this 18, half, 19 percent average. By the way, I, I made this presentation in a debate to a former member of the Clinton administration. And the moderator, uh, after I had mentioned that we've never been able to get more than 18, 19 percent out of the economy, turned to that member of the administration and said, is that true? How do you respond to that? And the member of the Clinton administration said, you know, he's absolutely right. We've not been able to figure out a way to do it in the United States of America, even with ta t high top marginal tax rates. But they do it in Europe. They do it in Europe. In Europe, the governments can get 30, 40, even 50 percent of the economy away from the private sector, away from people, and put it in the pockets of the government. How do you examine additional Is it recognized for one minute? And I put it to you, Ms. Madam Chairwoman, that that's what this debate is really about. That's what this debate is really about. Are we going to maintain the American system or are we trying to move towards a European system? And I tell you that that's really what this fight is all about. And the budget that we're here defending tonight uh, as members of the Joint Economic Committee is the budget that defends the American system, that defends a system that says the government really should only take 18 or 19 percent away from the private sector, that that's enough, that we don't want to be Europe where people take, pay VAT taxes and people pay additional, uh, much higher rates of, uh, of taxation. The government takes 30, 40, or 50 percent. And what the opposition is offering is a European-style model. So I simply ask my friends on both sides to consider what kind of country we want to be. Do we want to continue on as the America that we've known for years, or do we want to become Europe? Uh, and I suggest, Madam Chair, that, uh, that the former is the better course of action. Thank you very much. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from New York is recognized. Uh, speaker, I uh, yield uh, five minutes of uh, our time to the gentleman from California, Mr. Garamendi. The gentleman from California is recognized for five minutes. Uh, th thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we've heard a lot of discussion here this evening about what economic policy works where, where did the deficits come from. Let's just figure it out. Beginning with uh, this man over here, I think we'd all recognize him. That would be Ronald Reagan. After every year, at the end of the year, the Congressional Budget Office, nonpartisan, makes a projection of what's going to happen in the next 10 years. At the end of Ronald Reagan's period, uh, they did their projection and they said, ah, oh, voila, a $1.4 trillion deficit in the years ahead. Followed by uh, George Bush, the senior, at the end of his four years, they did another estimate. What's going to happen in the next 10 years? Well, let's see. That says $3.3 trillion deficit. How about that? We were just talking about some economic policy here a minute ago. Well, let's talk about the Clinton period. At the end of the Clinton period, eight years, another projection was made by the Congressional Budget Office. What's going to happen in the next 10 years? A $5.6 trillion surplus enough to pay off all of the American debt. How did it happen? How did it happen? It happened this way. Early in his administration, they set about to deal with the deficit. There was a tax increase. It cost my Democratic colleagues the House. But they did it. They put it in place. And they also put in place PAYGO and the balanced budget amendment. What happened was that in those eight years was the largest job growth in America's history except in the 1950-60 period. It was an enormous job growth. More than 20 million jobs were created and extraordinary revenue growth. So much for the argument we just heard. In fact, a combination of holding tight on the budget together with 
a tax increase worked. Now, I was part of that administration, and we were told to reinvent government. We did at the Department of Interior. We reduced the number of employees from 90 to 75,000, and we maintained and actually increased the efficiency and the effectiveness of that department. It can, and it was done. However, let's take a look at George W. Bush, <coughs> the most recent Bush presidency. At the end of his presidency, the Congressional Budget Office did their estimate, and they came up with an $11.5 trillion deficit in the years ahead. How did it happen? It happened this way. He cut taxes year one, 2001, cut taxes. Year two, 2002, cut taxes. Two wars, unpaid for, borrowed money from China, and then backed away from all regulation of Wall Street and the great crash the result in $11.5 trillion deficit. The day Barack Obama came into office, he was handed an 11, a $1.3 trillion bill due. That's what the Republican president gave to this nation and to this Congress. So we've set about solving it. Now I want to move to another issue here, which happens to be this debate about Medicare. You're not going to solve the Medicare problem which is one of ever-increasing cost in the underlying health sector of America. When I first became, got into this in 1991 as insurance commissioner, 9% of the American economy was in medical services. This year it's approaching 18%. You cannot solve this problem by throwing senior citizens off Medicare. It does not solve it. Do not throw the seniors to the wolves. The wolves are the insurance companies. I know. I was the insurance commissioner for eight years, and I fought those characters every year I was in office. I know what they will do to seniors. They will rip them off. They will deny benefits. They will deny coverage, and they will not control cost. In California this year, the insurance companies are raising costs by 20 to 40 percent. Medicare went up 6 percent. Medicare is efficient. Medicare is efficient. It is a nationwide policy. You can get it anywhere in this nation. There is no administrative cost that, if cost that even comes close to what the insurance companies in premium, profit, sales expenses, all of those things added up, and that includes the chaos at the delivery, the medical delivery. We need to change that. You want to deal with something more? Take a look at this. This is Medi-Cal, Medicaid. In Medicaid, the Republican budget intends to cut Medicaid by three quarters of a trillion dollars in the next decade. Who gets Medicaid? Senior citizens and the disabled, the aged, blind, and disabled get Medicaid. And this is immediate. Can I have another 30 seconds? Extend another minute. Thank the, you. The gentleman is recognized gets, for one minute. Thank you, Madam Chair.